You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. I feel like who art Ed? Try to spice it. Who art Ed? Mr. Wood art Ed me. Yeah. Either way, it, 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 it works on so many levels. I know. That's off to a great start. Welcome to Who Arted Weekly Art History for All Ages. I'm your host, Kyle Wood, and joining me today, I have Amy Bernard, fellow art teacher, uh, your background in ceramics as well as AP art history, which is perfect because today we're talking about Rachel Reich, uh, Fruit and Insects, which is one of the ones from the AP art history list. So thank you very much for coming on to join me. Yes, thank you for having me. Um, I, I am excited because this is one that like, I've seen her work before, but I hadn't known much about her. And so I appreciate having somebody who knows a little bit more than I do to, to get us through, um, some of this art history on what I was surprised, like has so much more to it than it first met the eye, you know? Mm -hmm. Yes, for sure. I think that's one of the best things about teaching this painting and just learning more about the painting is that there's so much underlying symbolism. And it's exciting to kind of dissect that with the students as well as like do a deep dive as a teacher. Yeah. So if I'm going to go back and dissect this work a little bit. I do want to get started with, you know, just a little bit of her background and her um, her biography. I always feel like the story is where these pieces come alive. So Reich was born June 3rd, 1664 in The Hague. Her grandfather on her mom's side was an architect. So it seems like the arts were running in the family. The architect Peter uh, Peter, but like P I E T E R post. Mm -hmm. And then her father, he was a scientist. And this is one of those things where I always feel like we do ourselves a disservice with that common phrase. Like it's an art, not a science or something like that. Right. Because there's mm -hmm. so much crossover in those different areas. Her father was a scientist teaching anatomy and botany, but he was also an amateur painter. He was doing those scientific diagrams and drawings of things from his cabinet of curiosities because that was an actual thing people had back in the day. And she learned a lot as a child just by looking at his collection of different specimen. Like he had preserved skeletons of various animals, plant, mineral samples, and all of that sort of stuff, which I... I find like must have been so interesting as a child. Yes, for sure. He um, definitely one of the best things about learning about Rachel and learning about her background is that her father was, I mean, obviously this amazing scientist and botanist, but I love that he had all of these specimens, like you said, to um, spark her imagination. And at a very young age, and she was only 15, he started her with an apprenticeship uh, with a still life painter. And by 18, she was already producing her first still life paintings and starting to establish a long and very successful career. So I think um, this is like really meaningful in many ways, but I love how, you know, she was a woman growing up in the 18th century in Holland um, and just like was supported by her family to apprentice and become a painter. And her father really helped her do that. And I think that's something that we still struggle with as art teachers today is trying to convince our parents that it's okay for your child to become an artist. Um, so I, I just love that part about her life. And granted, I mean, it was many, many years ago, but I still, I like to think of it in a, like a idealized way. <laughs> like this is really <laughs> what happened. <laughs> yeah. I mean, she was, she was also a very successful artist. Um, her name is not as well known today, I think as Rembrandt, but back in the day, her paintings were selling for more than Rembrandt's. Like she was a very successful and not just successful in terms of like she was a skilled painter. She was appreciated for her work and selling stuff to wealthy patrons throughout her life 
as you said, she started her apprenticeship at 15 and she was painting well into her 80s. Like she passed away, I think, at 86, but she had a good six decades of a successful painting career. Um, you know, just hopping about a little bit in in that timeline, you know, after she apprentices with Willem van Aylst. I'm yeah, sure I'm wrong on that. <laughs> I'm sure I'm wrong on that. But she apprenticed with Willem and he taught her a lot of techniques, as you said, with regard to the composition. And I think one of the things that's most interesting there, and I think you had this in your notes too, he focused on arranging a still life to feel natural. So it's not everything very neatly and precisely aligned. You know, he kind of he would kind of let things get a little bit wonky angles, give it that sense of gravity acting on them, which I think is really interesting because when we think of still life as a genre, I mean, the whole category of still life wasn't really a thing in and of itself up until like the Renaissance. That's like before that, like the still life, the arrangement of objects was kind of just like an element within a composition but it was around the Renaissance where we start to see the still life becomes its own subject or category or genre, however you want to phrase it, and largely symbolically, right? We had like the fruits of different seasons to capture the cycles of nature, the skulls to symbol symbolize obviousness, right? <laughs> Death mm -hmm. and all that. Yeah, Am yeah. I right in that? Yes, and I think another really fun fact about Rachel's paintings, um, and I think as a whole, the uh, painting, the still life paintings of the Dutch Renaissance, was these paintings were taken from like studies. So we would have many different varieties of flowers, many different varieties of fruits that would be not arranged like when you take it painting class in like undergrad or something, or even do it in high school where you arrange your objects on a picture plane and then you paint from life. Um, more often than not, these paintings were um, composed from different studies and they would have different varieties of flowers from different parts of the year, from different parts of the world. And especially because of Roisha's father being the collector of these curiosities, et cetera, really helped just kind of broaden her compositions and had it very, like a lot of variety, a lot of very interesting pieces. And just like you said, I mean, she also had this like almost like a whimsical quality to her work where she, it wasn't very, it wasn't like a tightly organized work of art. It was kind of wild. And I think that's something that we, um, today are drawn to because it's not so stiff and it's not so formal and it's just very beautiful to look at and very lush and one of my favorite art history words to use very sumptuous and I think that you get drawn in by the beauty but then when you further dissect the work that's when you start to become more invested and become more excited because there's so much underlying the beauty. I, I love that. And as you're talking about that and you're bringing in your favorite art history word of sumptuous, um, I was thinking of another term that I absolutely love that is like my go to. I want to sound pretentious term. I was thinking of sprezzatura, which is a term that means sort of a studied carelessness or a clumsy grace. And as I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking of this type of work as the synthesis of all those different different individual studies. Like she would do a study of a butterfly. She would do a study of grapes. She would do a study of, you know, wheat or a study of gourds or a study of all these different things. And then she would take those, the things she learned from those different studies of bugs and plants and flowers and fruit and put them together in this composition that feels natural and tossed together, but it's the result of a lot of years of practice and meticulous study, right? Yes. It's, and I yeah. love that term. I've never heard it before. Um, I think I'd add that to my list for sure, share it with my students when we return from spring break. But I think that 
that's just like one of the most amazing things about her work is that you can kind of create your own little story within a work of art from, you know, the 18th century, which is so exciting to be able to do. And I think what I like to teach my art history students is that if you can create a story and you can draw the viewer in and create a conversation, then that makes the artwork more meaningful. So one of when I was doing my master's in fine arts, one of my professors said, what does effective art do? It produces a discourse. And this is an effective piece of artwork hundreds of years afterwards, just because it still carries like these underlying messages of like the memento mori, the um, the whole idea of this concept of vanitas, which is another favorite term of mine to share with the students and just like a connection and it's connected to re religion as well. Um, but funny enough, the Dutch weren't very into like the church funding work. It was more of the merchant class this developing like wealth within like a middle, upper middle class, which you call the mer merchant class. And regular people were able to have artwork in their homes and they wanted things that looked pretty, but they also wanted this connection to being the good person, living life in a controlled and calm manner in order to achieve basically salvation. Um, but also they wanted these pieces that looked good in their homes. So they didn't necessarily want a painting of the last judgment, but they wanted a painting that would look good in their home, was easy to look at, could be gazed upon during like a dining room dinner party, but also had that deeper connection to being a good human, but also understanding that life is fleeting, which is the whole concept of Vanitas, which is directly related to the painting as well. Yeah, she's balancing a lot of competing different interests there with the the desire for something that is aesthetically pleasing, beautiful to look at, but also symbolically reinforcing those ideals of the society at that time, which I feel like just to tap into one last thing that I read in her background that just I had a hard time wrapping my brain around. We already talked about what a wonderful, like studied, careful, deliberate artist she was and, and how she worked for decades having this brilliant career, but she was a well-rounded whole human being who was also married and had 10 children. Just, I'm struggling <laughs> to keep up with two. She had 10 children and this wonderful, very difficult to to manage career, which hats off to her. Don't know how she did it, but she did. And so now after the break, we're going to dive deep into the story of the one specific piece, the fruit and insects. <laughs> So now I want to get into like we talked we've kind of danced around the symbolism of this specific work, but I want to get into it with a little bit more deeper dive. So we're looking here at fruit and insects from what year was that? Why can it's I seventeen eleven CE. Thank you. I, I knew it was like so I knew it went to someone in like the, the teens, but I knew it was made before that. So we're looking here at fruit and insects from 1711. Now, we've already said there's a lot going on here, but what are you noticing? What's jumping out at you? Gosh, I mean, the first thing I notice and, you know, our art students will recognize our formal analysis um, vocab by saying, what's the focal point? Like what draws your eye in? And I think that my eye bounces around, but the place that my eye goes first is probably the fruit in the middle, which I think are peaches. They look like white peaches. Um, they look very like soft and lush and, and beautiful. And that, you know, goes back to what we were talking about earlier about how the painting is beautiful, but it draws the eye in and helps us kind of connect a little bit more and makes us question what's going on here. And I think that I'm first drawn to those peaches, but then also there's a fly on the peach. And one of the peaches is slightly bruised and one of the peaches is slightly like dripping its um, juice. So it 
it first appears like a very idyllic still life, but then upon further investigation, we start to understand that perhaps this fruit is kind of like nearing its end when we wouldn't really want to eat it anymore. So that's where I go first. <laughs> yeah, I, I had similar thoughts with that sort of almost ironic juxtaposition of this fruit that seems so full of life and inviting, but then, you know, it's gathering flies, right? And mm -hmm. the... Uh, the product of, you know, years of Catholic school in me is also seeing sort of, as we talked about the symbolism where like there's, I think some Christian metaphors in here with the, the grapes and the wheat, which would have sort of a connection to, um, the, the Holy communion, right. The bread and the wine. But I also think of, you know, there are biblical passages about, you know, the, 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 grapes on the vine and all of that sort of stuff. And I don't want to turn this into a theological class, but I, I think I would be remiss if I didn't mention that that was a part of the the culture that was producing this, obviously. And I, I, I'm also just like drawn to, I, I love this idea of a still life that has living things in it, because that's not really typical of how we define the genre or the category, right? Like we take, we typically talk about a still life is inanimate objects. And so I love that there are insects and living creatures crawling around it. It gives it this more of the emphasis of life in the still life. And I think the angles help to, to reinforce that, you know, like as I look at it, when we get into the design principles and stuff like that, you know, I start to look at the leading lines and the angles that are created and the pathways for my eye to follow around this composition. And that's part of the reason I think it holds my attention is because there's this, there's this balance in these pathways that, that just lead my eye around in a way that's pleasant and holds me there. Absolutely. And I think um, there's definitely like this bouncing around of like uh like color, different colors, different hues that are similar. Like we have the plums on the left side, we have the grapes on the right side. They're a similar color. They have a similar highlight to them. So the eye bounces back and forth across the canvas. But when we have, say, the grapes in the middle, they're kind of like that greenish grape color. But then we bounce to the leaf, to the eggs in the nest, to the moss. And this is something that um, over the course of my art history career I've learned is characteristic of the high renaissance late renaissance in baroque time period and baroque is just like full of like lushness and drama and excitement and there's just like not a calm really place to rest in a composition and we can see that in other works but in this one particular you can really get a sense of like a diagonal moving about the painting and it creates this dynam dynamism which is um a really fun word to talk about as well it's definitely not like a static piece um another thing that you alluded to is that we have the living creatures so these were probably um like studies that rachel took from her father's specimens of animals who were dead and preserved and she creates um, this sense of life in the animals. I mean, the lizard has its mouth open. It's looking to kind of like attack the butterfly, maybe. Um, maybe the lizard is like going for the nest of eggs. There's just so many questions that we can't talk to Rachel about, unfortunately, but um, we can have that dialogue amongst ourselves about like what we think is happening in the painting. And that's like another really exciting thing about this work. Yeah, I think there's something, honestly, in some ways, I'm glad I can't talk to Rachel about this and get a definitive answer on this because there's so much going on. And maybe this is my own personal just inclinations to always want more, more, more. I teach elementary, so like the shinier, the more active, the better, right? Um, yeah. But I, I love that there's so much going on there. There are these different entry points and different narratives that I can sort of spin out in my head, which I think gives the piece more of that life. Because 
there's the piece that's static on the wall, but then there's what we imagine as the next step, the next frame in the, in that story or whatever it might be. Um, as we talk about it, like I say, we, we can spin out in different ways. You can imagine the narrative of that, that lizard going after the nest, or I could talk about, um, you know, the, the balance and the harmony of, we've got different types of grapes that are near complementary colors there that are, are on either side of those peaches that gives it this sort of symmetrical balance. I know it's not perfect symmetry and all of that sort of stuff, but you know, we see those different things in nature and the harmonies that are created by that. But then there's a tension of the different creatures and the way that we would imagine them interacting. And the thing I find most fascinating about this is the way that it is on first glance, just a bunch of fruit spilling out. Right. It feels like something you could walk by and you see a million of these things, but there's just so much there, which also feels like in the historical context, we're talking about 17th century. That's kind of the age when microscopes were a new thing and people were just discovering there's this whole other world of microscopic things that were unnoticed and unobserved prior to that. Right. And here at the end of the Dutch Renaissance Baroque time period, we're starting to get into this whole new time period, like the Age of Enlightenment and like a big push with science. And Rachel's work is connected to science because she's working from like life specimens and specimens that um, were preserved. But then we also have this whole other um, aspect of like the science behind artwork. And I mean, we're not quite there to the point where we're actually like looking at, um, like I'm thinking of certain paintings of like the philosopher giving a lecture at the Ori and like learning about how birds fly and learning about how the solar system works. We're not like quite there with this work, but we're still connecting to um, science. But I think that this is something that you um, mentioned earlier when you were talking about the connection to religion. And I think that's something that's really special about art is that if you have a background in religion, it brings a whole nother um, just set of skills that you can unpack works of art with. I don't have a strong background in any one religion. So it's taken me to be a student of some of these religions as I've um, become an art history teacher. But one of the, um, what, something from my notes that I always share with the students is that um, the Dutch were mostly Protestant and there wasn't this Catholic church, like the powerful monarchy who was um, there to commission artworks. So the works become a lot more uh, secular and they become more about like what people like would want in their homes, which I already talked about. But then there's also this huge connection to um, eternal salvation coming only through God, but also being careful to not become too attached to material possessions. And this is directly related to another Dutch painter of the time who's very well known, Johannes Vermeer, and his works like Woman Holding a Balance, Girl with a Pearl Earring, and those are really recognizable. Um, but this whole concept of being just living your life in a mindful manner. And it's just such an interesting concept to bring to the students. And I think it's a very timely one. It forces you to slow down and really just take in the imagery. And that's another really special thing about Dutch painting. I mean, not just from the Renaissance and yeah. Baroque period, but like all the way going back um, many, many hundreds of years. They were very interested on um, drawing the viewer in in order to have you meditate on the subject matter in order to become a better person. Yeah. And I think it's important to also recognize, you know, I talked about my, you know, religious background here, growing up Catholic schools and all of that. Um, but understanding religions it really helps you to understand different cultures and 
how that's reflected in the work. I'm thinking back to um, an earlier episode I did about Sharuvi Agrawal and her piece, 26,000 Bells of Hanuman, and why the bell was the perfect symbol because you ring a bell when you enter... Uh, when you enter um, the temple to alert the the deity of your presence as well as to block out other sounds. And now I'm also having the connection to, um, you know, like Japanese work and the Raku pieces and how that's a reflection of the philosophy. And now as the wheels are spinning out, I'm promising I'm going to bring this back to the Dutch here. Um, <laughs> you know, an interesting fact, you said the Dutch were largely Protestant and not sort of they had symbolism of their religious faith, but it wasn't beating you over the head with it the way that some other things were. And the Dutch, part of the reason that they were able to maintain trade contact with Japan while it was largely closed off from other Western countries was because of the fact that the Dutch did not try to convert them. And so that's why a lot of like the UKOA pieces that started to filter out into the West kind of came through the Dutch, right? Yeah. So it all comes together in understanding and respecting other people's different ideas and philosophies and, and religions. And I'm sorry, you were going to connect to something there. Oh, I don't remember. <laughs> no, <laughs> I, I, um, I think it's so, it's really exciting to um, just talk about all of these different ways that different cultures are connected and you know, my students and I will talk about like colonialism and um, iconoclasm and all of these really like interesting concepts that are so deep. And one of the pieces that um, I teach in APR in history is called the Allegory of Law and Grace. And this is also connected to um, the Reformation. So the Protestant Reformation and how one of the uh, one of my favorite articles for the smart history, like the subject line is, how do you get to heaven? And I think that that's something that's really important in a lot of the art that we look at. It's like, you know, really people are just trying to secure a place for themselves in an unknown future. Um, some, not all cultures, of course, feel this way, but I think that Many of the Western cultures that we study in our like European art history are very connected to this concept of what happens after you die. And this piece is, it's like subtly talking about what happens after you die. So I think that as, as an art history person, um, enthusiast, it's easy to really connect all of these different cultures and into this one concept because it is like the eternal question it's scary but it's exciting and it's just kind of like fun to talk about so now i went off on a big tangent <laughs> <laughs> no well but i think i think what we're getting at here is that one common thread across all different cultures that have different religious backgrounds and everything like that is one of the central questions that everybody deals with is what is the right way to live? And that is like the eternal struggle that all people have to grapple with and settle with. And a lot of people engage in that question through their religious backgrounds. And that influences the way that they shape their pieces. And so the more you can learn about those different backgrounds, those different cultures, those different beliefs, the more you'll understand and be able to make sense of the work that's created, whether it is by, you know, a Dutch artist in the 17th, I keep saying 17th century. And before someone all caps corrects me, um, <laughs> she was born in the 17th century, lived a good part of her life in the 17th century. I recognize this specific piece was 1711. So it was the early 18th century. Okay. Fact check yeah. myself there. We can move on. And I'm wrapping it up. I want just a three point rating scale. And where should this hang? The Louvre, is this something to look at? The lab. the lab, is this something to learn from? Or the Louvre? British for the bathroom. Yeah, there's a the poop Louvre. joke in there somewhere. Yeah. Oh, that's terrible. I think you and I have proved that I'll probably pick the second one. Um, it's, it's just so interesting to look at this work and do like, you know, as 
as we are people like to say that deep dive into like what these what this means and I think sometimes when a work goes up in the museum it loses a little bit of its magic because you know us Chicagoans are very proud of the fact that we have you know the giant Surratt at the Art Institute of Chicago and it's an amazing museum but it just almost becomes a tourist attraction but with yeah. this piece, I just don't know. First of all, it's small. So I think that it would be kind of lost in a museum. And I think that I would almost rather see it like in a very tiny collection where I could just like sit on a chair and just look at it and just kind of connect with the work and like think about Rachel's life and were there babies crying when she, one of her 10 babies <laughs> while she was trying to like depict these glorious fruits Um just kind of thinking about what life was like for her and for just the message that she was trying to convey. So I, I don't know. I feel like it definitely doesn't belong in the loo, um, but I would probably say lab. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like there's obviously a strong argument there, given the fact that she did all these studies, she learned from her father who was a scientist and amateur artist. And I feel ridiculous calling him an amateur artist because I don't know if you've looked at his works but they no. do not feel amateur to me like they are really strong scientific diagrams and 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 drawings it's just that he wasn't making his living by selling them but like when we say amateur at something a, a lot of times that feels dismissive he was definitely highly skilled that tangent aside um I ultimately landed on museum just mm -hmm. because of the fact that as, as you had talked about earlier, the, the Dutch were trying to create something that is visually pleasing to enjoy as well as to learn from. And so I feel like it's got, I feel like it's a little bit in both camps there, but I ultimately ended up at museum because it just feels pleasant to look at and sit and enjoy and think about um, but I also totally see your point that it is small and it, it needs that intimate setting. And sometimes in the museum, when there are guards around and crowds around, you lose something in that. Um, luckily I'm not an actual curator, so it doesn't really matter. I'm just trying to categorize what type of piece is this. Um, and I think largely I'm trying to disagree with you for the sake of a segment, but we ended up saying versions of the same thing here. It's a beautiful yeah. <laughs> piece to enjoy and to learn from. Absolutely. Well, thank you once again, Amy Bernard. I really appreciate your taking the time to, to teach me quite a bit about an artist that, I had just passed by in my earlier studies. So thank you. Thank you for having me. It was very fun to talk about Rachel and her work and just that time period of her life. So I appreciate it. This concludes this week's episode of Who Arted, part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. If you found this tolerable, please leave a rating or review on your favorite podcast app. You can find images of the work being discussed this week and every week on social media at Who Arted Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And of course, on the website, whoartedpodcast.com. Podcast done.